The pilot of this aircraft is William Rhodes Morehouse, the first man of Māori lineage to ever fly a plane. He is seen here in this rare footage in a plane that he helped design and build. In 1912, aviation was still in its infancy and crowds would line the fields of Britain and Europe to catch a glimpse of these fearless daredevils. Like many of the early aviators, he had a passion for speed and often found himself in trouble with the law. Once labeled by a judge worthless to society, he would show fearlessness while carrying out a suicidal mission and become the first airman to receive the Victoria Cross. It has to be a act of bravery in the face of the enemy, effectively beyond the call of duty, and often either entails some heroic act that changes the battle, or an act which has saved a colleague's life. Kaite kōta nāka e rā mai e mai e e e i tāwai. Mo tēnei ta mai kei rotu te pakanga te tuatai, tāi te kite tohu o te 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 ripeka o o te tori. Aho koa tērā tangata kei tāwai ka ngaro ki a mātou mō tōna oranga. To fully understand the story of how a part Māori airman became the first Air VC, we must journey back to the time of his grandfather on the high seas of the South Pacific. Master Jones! Let's take her around the start. He went to sea at a very early age probably before he was into his teens, and worked in the Orient trade. He traveled to India, the West Indies. Uh, by the time he was in his early 20s, he actually had a share in a vessel and was commanding it. Steady as you go, Mr. Cuddy. He ended up going whaling, and this is how he first came to the New Zealand waters from about 1836. He sailed quite extensively around the New Zealand coasts. <laughs> I te tuatai, ko e rā e rā mai ngā kara e o te moan. Me nā tōra, e rā atu o ngā mō mō mai. But in late 1839, that a settlement was to be established, a colony was to be established in the vicinity of Port Nicholson. Rhodes came in, and over the next month or so, he sailed down the east coasts of both islands, setting up pork and potato collecting stations. He also brought some stock with him, which he offloaded, some at Kapiti Island, uh, some at Akaroa. The relations, uh, certainly from 1839-40, were, were very positive. It's not too much to say that I think for most of the 1840s, Wellington actually subsisted on Maori goodwill and Maori produce. In fact, a lot of the, the goods that were exported from Wellington uh, were in fact goods that had been cultivated by Māori or had been supplied, for example, in the pork trade. Ko e te e atu, ka whaia ki nei ki te he wāene, ka kite te tangata anō o Ingarangi, he wāene, ka mau ki eia, ana ka moi ki eia, ka puta mai he, he, he tamaiti and ngā tamariki. Rhodes began trading with local Māori and soon after began a relationship with a woman from Te Aropā named Otahui. E wāene nō Taranaki, a tūturu me te atiawa, me nā te tama oki, e rā ngā wakapapa kei wainga nui. And the following year, Otahui gave birth to a baby girl. By 1850, the world around Māori was changing rapidly. I e rāua, kei te hoko oku a mātou wenua i Ingarangi, i rānana, kare mātou e mō eo i e rā mai. I, I te tainga mai e o rāta o te nuenga, te uru e te mano, kare, kare mātou e mō eo ki te nā mai. Ana, hei ana, ka ngaro, ka ngaro te tangata ki roto, ka ngaro te wenua oki. Rhodes was a little bit of an outsider in the settlement. He was 
certainly one of its movers and shakers, one of its money men, the entrepreneur beyond all entrepreneurs in some ways. He was one of the founders of the Bank of New Zealand. He was a founding member of the New Zealand Insurance Company, the New Zealand Shipping Company. There was very little in the way of enterprise in Wellington itself that he wasn't involved in. But as the colony grew, so did social pressure. He married Sarah King, who was the daughter of John King, one of the, the prominent lawyers uh, in early Wellington. With his accumulating wealth, he built a homestead called the Grange in Wadestown. Like most of the Māori parts of this story, we don't know exactly why, but the baby girl who would be christened Mary Ann Rhodes was gifted to Barney Rhodes and his wife. The child, as far as I can establish, must have been born about 1850, so it would be certainly before his marriage uh, to Miss King. She was generally regarded in the settlement as being Rhodes's natural daughter, the term that they, they used at that particular time to refer to a child born out of wedlock. <laughs> Mary Ann would have no contact with her birth mother or Māori whānau again. And WB and his wife raised Mary Ann in the European fashion, and despite several attempts, they would have no other children. And it was a marriage that lasted 10 years because, in fact, his first wife died quite young. It's an index of, of Rhodes's increasing social acceptability that he contracted his second marriage to a young woman who was roughly half his age, who was the sister of William Sefton Morehouse, superintendent of the province of Canterbury. He was probably one of the wealthiest men in New Zealand by this point. W.B. Rhodes died in 1878 and was buried at the Bolton Street Cemetery. After contesting the will in a legal battle, Mary Ann was awarded a handsome payout that would make her the richest woman in New Zealand. As Mary Ann grew, so did her desire to see the places that she had read about or had been told by her father. She travelled to Britain and Europe, where she took in the great cities. Having white and Māori blood, obviously produced the most beautiful combination because she was considered very beautiful and she had many suitors. And um, she actually did fall in love with her stepmother's brother, who was considerably older than herself. When they got married, they really came to England almost as soon as they were married. And from that moment on, she really became totally English. On the 26th of September, 1887, Mary Ann gave birth to her second child. It was a boy who would be named William Barnard Rhodes Morehouse. Will was a very animated character who often had the nursing maids entertained. He had a special bond with his sister Anne, who protected him and was adored by his mother. In the early days, they resided in Knightsbridge, London, but moved to Northampton so Will's father could pursue his passion for hunting. He was looking for a large house where he could stable all his horses, his hunters. Now, he chose here because the Pytchley hunt was a very famous hunt, and lots of wealthy people hunted with the Pytchley. Oh, Will? Yes, father? He tried endlessly to get Will involved, but the boy was not interested. His passion was in mechanics and engineering. 
He was obviously a very rebellious kid, mainly I think because his father was a, quite an old man. His father was much older than his mother, 15 or so years older than his mother, and I think his father sort of lost interest in the whole business when he was fairly young. The first school Will attended was the Golden Parsonage, a prep school in Hertfordshire. He was then accepted into Harrow on the outskirts of London. He was not a success at Harrow. He was much more interested in, in uh, motor cars, which were also in their infancy then, and cycles, bicycles, and things like that. And I think he was more of a practical daredevil sort of a kid than a scholar. By the time he was 17, he had a number of motor vehicles and was racing them at every opportunity. Well, I've interviewed a number of elderly people in the village in the last few years, and some of those have actually remembered Will himself, or they tell stories of their father. Uh, one of the elderly gentleman's father says that he and his brothers used to be asked to sit in the back of Rhodes Moor House's motor cars as he flew around the countryside in them, driving very fast for those days, of course, as acting as sort of ballast so to keep the cars down. Everybody in the village thought he was an absolute madcap, a daredevil, because he drove so fast. In 1906, Will set sail for New Zealand. Ah. Ah, oh, Tearoa, land of the long white cloud. Like his grandfather before him, he was about to meet his mother's homeland. When the news of his arrival spread, Will Rhodes Moore House was given a traditional welcome. He was intrigued by his Māori relatives and wondered why his mother had not spoken of them. He didn't know what all the fuss was about, but apparently there was a huge interest in him. But he'd never been warned beforehand about Māori. He was able to carry it off. If one says that he could have been an actor, I'm sure it would have been rather wonderful, but there's no way he was expecting anything. In Wellington, Will stayed at the Grange and took daily excursions around the fast-growing Harbour City. He then travelled to Christchurch to visit relatives, where suddenly his trip to New Zealand turned into a nightmare. Will was testing a motorcycle on New Brighton Beach. As he approached the pier, a young boy ran into his path from behind a post and was struck. The little boy, I think, was probably frightened by the noise and the speed of this guy herring along the beach. He was not used to coping with that sort of speed, so ran out and got run over. The place was called Brighton, with huge expanses, and maybe, maybe the last thing that one would have expected would be a pedestrian. The young boy named Kenneth Goulet died in hospital later that night. Will was charged with manslaughter, and although the charges were later dropped, he would find no peace, and the Gourlay family would be left without their son. He returned to England, still out of sorts, and attended a crammer school before being accepted into Trinity Hall at Cambridge. He loved mechanical things, both old and new, and could be seen riding around the streets on a penny farthing. I don't think his heart was ever in scholarship at all. He was an engineer, a mechanic, he was a man who liked making things and tinkering with machines. That was his prime interest. One day, while at home in Northampton, Will's life was changed forever. Linda and Will's sister, my grandmother Anne, were best friends from the age of 15. <laughs> Well, this is my good friend, Linda. It's a pleasure to meet you. 
I've heard a lot about you. <laughs> nice motorcycle. Linda and Will, they seem to be made for each other. I believe it's time for supper. I'll be in soon. The internal combustion engine, with its lightweight and power, was revolutionizing travel. It also held the key for man to finally fly. All over the world, men were building flying machines. Some successful, others destined for failure. In 1908, Orville and Wilbur Wright brought their biplane to Europe and dazzled crowds with their display. Will's desire to fly and become part of this new wave of technology led him to team up with James Radley, one of Britain's foremost aviators. The following year, they sailed across the Atlantic with a manager and a Blerio to compete in the barnstorming air shows in the United States. They were commended for their efforts at Belmont Park in New York. He was in New York, I think he was in Philadelphia, and then he went to San Francisco. James Radley was the team's senior pilot, but Will took every opportunity to get a feel for the machine, showing a natural talent as a pilot. They were very early days of flying. It's, it was remarkable of what they achieved, those young guys at that time. It was amazing. Not long after their return, they formed the Port Holm Aerodrome Company, a business of aeroplane manufacturers, aviators and engineers. They began making their own version of the Blerio with significant modifications. They built the Radley Moore house, but that was no mean feat. You've got to remember that that was just a few years after the Wright brothers, and it was a much more sophisticated aircraft than the Wright brothers flew. His interest to start with was in what made aircraft work and, and uh, how you put them together. And uh, it was when he started to fly and found it so exhilarating that the flying became even more important than the engineering. Will was a local hero for the people of Northampton, and he made numerous flights and displays around the country. Crowds would be captivated by this amazing achievement of mankind. He made several cross-country flights and landed on the field known as Parker's Peace in Cambridge. Rosemore House flew around and landed on football fields and scared the daylights out of the local population, but, but fascinated them at the same time. And there are several occasions, I think one of them was in Nottinghamshire, where he suddenly arrived out of the blue one night and landed on the a local uh, reserve and everybody came and had a look at it. And the next day or later in that day, he took off again and went somewhere else. Northampton is a boot and shoe town. That's the industry that uh, Northampton has had for centuries. And William Morehouse, this was another first for him uh, because he carried a consignment of boots and shoes from Barrett's, one of the big shoe companies in Northampton, by aeroplane down to Hendon on the outskirts of London. Uh, and this was supposed to be the first commercial flight of anything in this country. A week later at Brooklands, he was officially granted his aviator certificate by the Royal Aero Club. Will entered a number of air races in Britain, placing several times and winning. One of the biggest events he competed in was the Daily Mail race around London, in which he came second. Great risk came with the glamour for these pioneers and Will was stunned when his good friend Graham Gilmore plummeted to his death after the wings of his plane collapsed. Graham Gilmore was a very famous uh, aviator as well, and it tells you something about the danger of flying in those days. Those aircraft were pretty fragile. Always standing near his side was his sweetheart Linda, whom he had developed a romance with. Will's relationship with Linda blossomed 
and the pair were inseparable. They both had a thrill-seeking spirit, but they also loved to get away and spend time together. In 1912, the young couple married at St. Paul's Knightsbridge, with many airmen among the guests. Linda and Will carried out many exploits before they were married and when they were married. They headed to France for their honeymoon, where Will intended to fly across the channel with Linda and a reporter. Excuse me, Will, can I get a picture? Very good. If they were successful, he would be the first to do so. It wasn't very long after Blero had first done it on his own, and they decided they would fly um, three people across the channel, one of whom was a newspaper reporter. The aircraft was a 110 horsepower Breguet, a French airplane produced at a factory nearby. The problem, however, was the weather, and the trio were forced to wait for weeks before they could attempt a crossing. Desperate to get underway, they took off in marginal conditions and hit turbulent skies halfway through the journey. Will skillfully guided the craft, finally making the English coast some 45 minutes after takeoff. Unable to fully control the plane, he ditched near Ashford in Kent. What a huge effort it was for three people in one aeroplane to cross from France to England. And they crash landed and she was um, carrying a child and she miscarried. Devastated at losing their baby, the newlyweds retired to Cornwall to recuperate. After losing a baby in an aviation accident, Will Rhodes Morehouse and his wife Linda spent time with friends in Cornwall. While reflecting, they took time out to explore the countryside. 1912, there are pictures of them, you know, doing all the things you do in Cornwall, and one particular thing Will did was he created a swimming pool in a bay called Trianon Bay, which everyone uses today. The water is absolutely crystal clear, and it's fully out of one's depth with a diving board, and this is all natural but it only came about because Will was able to dam up one tiny route where the tide was pouring out of this rock. And by filling that in, it became a permanent swimming pool. Heading back to Northampton, Will began to reevaluate his priorities and decided to keep his feet on the ground for a while. He stopped in London to pick up his Astro Daimler a beautiful and advanced piece of machinery. Will loved working on his cars and would spend hours fine-tuning them for peak performance. And when William began to drive motor cars, some of these stable hands and grooms turned their hand at being a mechanic and helped him to look after his motor cars. Soon, he was heading back to France, where he teamed up with his old buddy, James Radley, and the rally of Monte Carlo. Will was a great dancer, and he and Linda were regulars on the social scene. While in France, Linda gave Will the good news. They were pregnant again. Aviation continued to grow around the world. In New Zealand, this monoplane built by Charles Fisher was flown by Theo White and the Wairarapa. Will found it impossible to subdue his desire to fly, and it wasn't long before he was in the skies over France. Push, darling. Push, darling. Push, you're doing great, darling. You're doing great, darling. Push, push. One more big push. You've done it. You've done it. 
done it. On the day that Linda went into labor, the doctor was late arriving, leaving Will to deliver the baby. It was a boy, and they named him William Henry, but his dad just called him Sonny. But their world, like so many others, was about to be consumed by a cloud of darkness. In the troubled Balkans, plans were in place that would set the world into a catastrophic war like no other. While in Sarajevo, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, was assassinated by Serbian nationalists. Tensions in Europe had been building for some time. And for those that wanted war, this presented the perfect opportunity to expand their empires. Many of the great European powers had treaties with each other. And over the following weeks, a dangerous game of provocation was played out in the corridors of power. Back in England, the Morehouse family was planning a move south. Not all that long before the war, the family bought Parnham House, uh, a beautiful big mansion in Dorset. It's a large mansion, beautifully situated below a hill where he and um, Linda one day wanted to build a house of their own right on the top of the hill. Meanwhile, the situation in Central Europe had not improved. Peacemakers had worked hard, but the will for war was too great. In a sorry state of misplaced imperial honor and military egos, the First World War began. While Austro-Hungarian forces moved south, Germany's army moved west to Belgium and France. Thank you, Sophie. <clears throat> what is it? It's official. <laughs> We're at war. Dear God. Will you go? After battling themselves to a standstill in their initial fighting, both sides began to dig in and hold what little ground they had gained. Once the war had developed by um, the end of uh, 1914, when the winter occurred, and they began to uh, dig in these famous trench systems from the North Sea to Switzerland, there was a big uh, gash all the way down France, filled with soldiers, machine guns, barbed wire. Suddenly the generals needed reconnaissance and their traditional method of getting it from cavalry patrols was stopped. Warfare had changed. Reluctantly at first, aircraft were now given the opportunity for action. So the airplane was suddenly important because that could do the cavalry roll and fly over these obstacles and see what was happening on the other side of the hill. As it developed, they could photograph them quite well. That time, it was a defining moment of warfare moving from what were fixed positions of men on the ground to this new dynamic of being up in the air. It was like bringing 3D uh, to the battlefield. At the age of 27, a Will was considered old to be volunteering for duty, and his application was initially turned down. But with the lack of experienced pilots, he joined the Royal Flying Corps at Farnborough, the location of the Royal Aircraft Factory. His first duties were testing aircraft and equipment, giving valuable feedback to designers and engineers. In 1915, the airplanes at that time on the British side were a lot BE-2s, biplanes, which were two-seater planes, one pilot and one observer. And that was the main use of the airplane. It was for observation. He also provided experience for younger pilots who were eager to see action.
In February, he took leave and went home to see his family. Everyone was happy to see him, but no one knew what was about to unfold. When Will reported back for duty, he was transferred to Merville in France, where he was about to find out just how bad the war was. In March of 1915, William Rhodes Morehouse, an aviation pioneer, touched down at the Royal Flying Corps airfield in Merville, France. The base was commanded by Major Webb Bowen and his flight commander was Morris Blake. Will was keen to get involved wherever he was needed. The war by this stage was locked in a stalemate. Neither side was able to take the advantage. The aeroplane with its mobility was now of vital importance to both sides. The aircraft's role in these early days was purely reconnaissance. There was no air fighting as such. If you came across a German airplane, you might wave just as easy as you shot at him. The city of Ypres was a thorn in the side for the German forces. It remained the only major city in Belgium that was not under German control. While for the British and their allies, it represented victory or defeat. Eager to make a breakthrough, German command mobilized a secret new force. Known as the Disinfection Unit, they were about to unleash a weapon that would change the way wars were fought. On the 22nd of April 1915, the battle began conventionally with heavy artillery fire. However, around 5 p.m. that afternoon, the valves of 6,000 canisters containing chlorine gas were opened. Fanned by an easterly, a yellow smoke drifted silently toward the Allied lines. And it was spotted from the air by a chap named Louis Strange in an airplane, seeing this funny cloud stuff coming across the ground. And of course, he decimated the frontline troops. Now, this was a great problem because now Epes was in grave danger. Germans now realized that they did have an advantage, so they were going to push more troops into the area, and it became an all-important uh, mission for the rails line stations to be disrupted to uh, curtail this reinforcement. The target was the railway station of uh, Courtrai, and for the Germans it was one of the main points where troops were assembled and from there were trained uh, to the actual uh, front area. Aerial bombing had not been widely used at this stage of the war, and the accurate targeting of rail networks was random at best. The engineers at Number 2 Squadron planned to rig a 100-pound bomb under the fuselage of the plane. In terms of aerial warfare, this was entirely new. There was only one man with enough experience to carry out such an operation. His flight log shows him testing the aircraft just two days before the mission. Will knew that to get a direct hit, he would have to fly as close to the target as possible, putting his life in real danger. On the eve of his mission, he wrote letters to Sonny and Linda. Sonny was born in 1914, so he was, would have been less than a year old, but there was a famous letter that was left for him by Will. It must have been assumed that he may well not come back, and therefore wrote the letter to be read should he not come back. My dear Sonny, this is the first and last letter I shall ever write to you. You are now just over a year old and the dearest happy little chap I have ever seen, and thank God you don't realize the awful war that is going on now. Years hence, you will be shown this letter in your dad's photograph by your dear mother, who has always been the sweetest and dearest wife 
a man could possibly have. Your dear mother and I have never had a quarrel, and it is for you to fill up the gap by exerting all your energies to be a great comfort to her, who has been so sweet to your dad and yourself. Tomorrow I am going out at a very early hour, long before you will be out of bed on an expedition which, if this letter reaches home, I shall be dead. Always keep up your position as a gentleman and make your friends at school true friends. Not for what they can get, but friends because they like you as a good fellow. I am looking at your sweet little face now, and God bless you, my dear boy. Goodbye, Sonny. Your loving father, Will Rhodes Morehouse. My dearest Linda, goodbye, darling. I am off on a trip from which I don't expect to return, but which will I hope shorten the war a bit. I shall probably be blown up by my own bomb, or if not, killed by rifle fire. Well, God bless you, my darling. I have no regrets. We have never had a quarrel, and dear old Sonny will help to fill the gap. Goodbye, my darling Pin. God keep you always, dear. From Will. Will left Merville at 15.30 hours and headed northeast to Courtrai. He managed to cross the front and get to the outskirts of the city without being detected. However, as he entered the city, he was spotted by observers who sounded the alarm. The Germans around it had some defenses, mainly from some high buildings, where they had installed a few machine guns eh, as a kind of covering up of that area, because they know that the uh, railway junction was important to them. He had to fly very low and very slow to drop his bomb accurately in the middle of that. So when the Germans got to see him immediately, they started to fire with, his, uh, with their Maxim uh, machine guns. Courage, which gets a Victoria Cross, can be broken down into a number of categories. You get those which are cold and calculating courage of somebody who in advance knows the perils and dangers and still goes in. He would have decided that the closer they are to the target, the more chance of making uh, their bomb count. Flying at a safe height of 1,500 feet didn't sound a lot, but a bomb could have gone anywhere. You know, you've got to miss by a couple of yards and you do no damage. Uh, the plane was badly damaged. Rose Morehouse was uh, wounded on a few fingers and also in his stomach and some vital organs. When he was above the railway station of Courtrai, which is only a few hundred meters from where he was shot, so it all happened in a, a few seconds. He had to lose everything and drop there manually the bomb. He nearly got a crash, actually, on the station, but he was just in time to handle that back and, and got over with his pain. Badly wounded and losing blood, Will Rhodes Morehouse struggled to guide his plane back to his base in France. As he approached the front lines, he dove down to gain airspeed. This made him an easy target for enemy snipers.
rather than just land his plane, maybe uh, being made a prisoner of war, he was able to nurse it back and land it. Get a stretcher! Immediately after his landing in Merville, he was, of course, taken away by stretcher bearers. Well, <coughs> get him to the ambulance. On, let's get him out he here. was still very conscious of uh, what happened. Before he was taken to hospital, he gave a full report of the mission. He noted significant destruction to a section of the rail. German troops were forced to disembark and march by foot to the front line. This gave the Allies valuable time to shore up defenses before the next wave of German attacks. Will was taken to number six hospital, but there was nothing that could be done. A bullet had practically ripped his stomach to pieces. Doctors did what they could to ease the pain, but it was just a matter of time. Morris Blake kept a bedside vigil. He asked for a photo that he kept of his wife and son. He told Blake how he shared all his secrets with her and how he had delivered his boy into the world. A note came down from command that Will had been recommended for the DSO. No good to me when I'm dead, he said. Even on his deathbed, flying was never far from his thoughts. It's strange dying, Blake, old boy. Unlike anything one has ever done before. Like one's first solo flight. The most remarkable thing for me about Rose Morehouse is not what happened to him in his already remarkable life, but after that, because from the beginning of the war, it was decided that soldiers uh, who got killed here would not be repatriated. They would be buried here on the site on the Western Front and remain here forever. For instance, Queen Victoria's grandson who was a prince who got killed here in 1914. His body also stayed here in the area. But it's very exceptional that an, uh, a war hero who was killed on the Western Front was buried back home in England. The reasons are unclear, but Will's body was transported back to England, where he lay in state at Parnham House. Led by the Bishop of Westminster, he was given a funeral with full military honours. He was laid to rest on this hill, where he had planned to build a house with Linda and Sonny. This was in fact, to be the, where they were to live. And that is why um, it must have been a very emotional moment when he was buried that she collapsed, couldn't face the rest of the service and rushed headlong down the very, very steep avenue back to the house. News of his heroic act spread throughout the nation, drawing praise and recommendation for awards. He carried out what was considered one of the bravest acts ever, which of course it was, without any hesitation. He was actually awarded the DFC while he was still alive. But it was only subsequently that the king heard of the action and he was posthumously awarded the VC. He was awarded for his act of bravery uh, in an almost impossible mission, uh, the Victoria Cross, the highest British military distinction and the first Air VC ever.
courage which gets a Victoria Cross, you get those who in advance knows the perils and dangers and still goes in. I would suggest that his selfless sacrifice in what he did and how he managed that direct hit and how many lives it must have saved, that he perhaps would have felt the sacrifice was worth it. <laughs> Kate very proud. Uh, Ito na mai. Aho kwa ka wehi ai ya kanaro ai ya kia mata. Ito wa ita wa ia ia. Kate kate aroha pai kate okaro pai mu. He wa nanga. He wa nanga. Like the rest of the world. He had no idea that this bloody conflict would rage on for another three years. They fought on the land. They fought on the seas. They fought in the skies. Finding new and better ways to kill. until they could fight no more. Finally, in December of 1918, the guns stopped. If you ask me, in the First World War, there were no winners, only losers. The Germans obviously lost immediately the, the military actions, but it led to some revanchism. Eh? Uh, they were treated very bad by the Treaty of Versailles, eh? that in fact, uh, there was already the beginning of a Second World War. Like many children of his generation, Willie would grow up fatherless. He spent most of his time at Parnham House under the caring eye of his grandmother, Mary Ann. Often told stories of his father and his daring exploits, the seeds of adventure were planted in the young boy's mind. Well, Willie, it was almost too good to be true. He got his pilot's license before he was 17, and he was at Eton College, and so he became the flying Etonian. He wasn't at all interested in anything other than flying and skiing and all the sort of things that you'd attribute to a playboy. But in fact, I don't think anyone would have ever called him a playboy to his face. In 1936, Willie married his sweetheart Amelia, the daughter of Sir Stephen Dimitriadi. The following year, he joined 601 Squadron with Amelia's brother Dick. Known as the Millionaire Squadron, it was the brainchild of Lord Grosvenor. With war looming, Willie was called into full service and mounted a raid on a German submarine base flying Blenheims. The squadron was re-equipped with hurricanes and in a strange twist of fate, he found himself in Merville, France, the same airfield that his father had flown from. However, the situation in France was hopeless and the squadron was moved to Tanmere in West Sussex. During one of the air battles, Amelia's brother was shot down and Willie was left to break the news. The battle for Britain raged on with wave after wave of German attacks. Willie acquitted himself well and shot down nine enemy aircraft. He and Amalia were honored to be invited to Buckingham Palace, where Willie was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. But just three days later, he was shot down over Kent, and his plane crashed in a ball of flames. When he was killed in September 1940, so that the life went out of the squadron when he was killed because Everything he did, he was always central to. Willie's remains were cremated and laid to rest with his father at the airman's grave in Dorset. Rightly, these brave souls had been immortalized for giving their lives so freely. But like all those who perished in the First and Second World Wars, they were sorely missed by those who knew them best. Jack down some gun over in France today.
keeps fit, doing his bit, up to his sleeves and clay. Each night after a fight, past the time alone, he's got a little gramophone, plays the song. Take me back to dear old Blighty. Put me on the train for London town. Take me over there, drop me anywhere. Liverpool, Leeds, or Birmingham. I don't care. Love to see. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.